Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett along with Kent Myers. We're here every week, as you know, dealing with topical issues and meeting interesting people and we welcome in a return guest. Yes, and a very interesting person, I might add. Uh, the Honorable Jerome Holmes from the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals is joining us to talk about the Tenth Circuit Court, his background, experiences, and what uh, he enjoys doing and as a judge and maybe what he doesn't enjoy doing. Uh, he has been on with us once before, but then when he was a private practitioner, not a judge, this is his first appearance with us uh, since he's joined the Tenth Circuit, and we're thrilled to have him. Can't wait to hear from him. Jerome Holmes, today's guest on The Verdict. We'll be right back. I've known I was going to be an artist since I was a little kid. I still have teachers that in grade school that still have my artwork. I think I told them something along the lines, this is keep that, it's going to be worth money someday. I'm Justin Mater, I'm an artist, and I'm Chickasaw. My muse is the Muskokian, the Mississippian art. When I see that, my mind just fills up with bubbles of ideas. My big thing right now is shell carving, the shell gorgets. My work is refined more and more until I found my own rhythm. I also do metallurgy, where I've uh, been acid etching copper and hammering copper to make a copper repose. You only have one chance to do it right, so it, it requires a lot of planning and thought and just patience. My Chickasaw heritage is the foundation of who I am. It's the roots of where I come from, and it inspires me as an artist and inspires the tenacity of never giving up. Learn more about today's Chickasaws at profilesofanation.com. We're back on the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. Today is a particular pleasure for me to welcome uh, back to the set of The Verdict the Honorable uh, Jerome Holmes judge on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, judge Holmes did his undergraduate work at Wake Forest, did his law work at Georgetown Law Center, uh, got a master's in public administration from uh, Harvard University. He uh, then became uh, a law clerk to the Honorable Wayne Alley here in the Western District of Oklahoma, thereafter to the Honorable William J. Holloway, Jr. Uh, on the clerk uh, judge on the uh, Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, he uh, has had several years in private practice uh, here in Oklahoma City. He was an assistant United States attorney in the Western District for approximately 11 years. He was nominated to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals position by uh, President George W. Bush and was confirmed by the Senate in 2006 and has been on the Tenth Circuit uh, since that time. Uh, we're sure glad to have you. Welcome back. I'm delighted to be here. It's, it's great to be back with you, Kent and Mayor. It's a, always a pleasure to be with you. Let's talk about the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. How are things going in general? Uh, I'm pleased to report that uh, the state of the Tenth Circuit is good. Uh, we uh, now have a full complement of 12 judges, and uh, it took a while to get back to that point. And uh, we're doing quality work, and uh, it's a good situation right to now. To those who don't follow those circles, what type of cases would come to the, to the Tenth Circuit? Um, I, I often answer that question by saying it's easier to say what the federal courts don't do than what they do. Uh, <laughs> All right, handle uh, it that way. Uh, domestic relations, uh, and, I, and I take some great gratitude in that, uh, <laughs> that uh, we don't uh, deal with uh, divorces and that sort of thing. And. Uh, and, and outside of that, there, there are certain monetary restrictions on uh, cases, uh, and, and, and we don't deal with intra-state suits involving people suing each other. Uh, and so uh, with very few limitations uh, on subject matter, we take almost anything. I mean, we have employment law cases. We have, uh, we have natural resources disputes. Uh, we get a lot of those in the Tenth Circuit because uh, the states that are in the Tenth Circuit, like Utah and Wyoming, have large expanses uh, uh, of, of land that is owned by the federal government. And, and, and whenever the federal government gets involved, the potential mm -hmm. for litigation uh, is there. And so, so we hear a lot of different kinds of suits. What person or what body of people determine what cases get to the circuit court? Um, 
Well, in the circuit court, with certain restrictions that are set by statute, really is a court uh, that entertains appeals that are brought by the parties. I mean, you have a situation, and I would contrast that with the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a court of discretionary jurisdiction. They make determinations as to what cases yeah. they will take or we they will not this, take. We will hear this, we will not right. hear that. That's right, yeah, they yeah. vote to do that. But in the case of uh, the Tenth Circuit, uh, there are certain restrictions you have to meet in terms of the timing of the filing of the appeal, and, and of course you have to pay the appellate fee to file, but with those restrictions met, is those cases that were in the pipeline from the trial court, it's up to the parties. Now, uh, filing appeals can be an expensive enterprise, and, and some parties uh, choose not to do that, but, uh, but that potential uh, generally is there. Uh, getting down a little more basic and the, kind of the topic Mick was talking about, I think it's important for our viewers to understand that the only cases your court will entertain are cases that have come from the federal court system at a lower level. Oh, abso oh, oh absolutely. In other words, a state court decision would never get to to your court. Well, it would go a different that, well, route. Well, that's, that's exactly right. That's a, that is the basic <coughs> fundamental point to make. Although we have uh, very broad sort of subject matter jurisdiction uh, in terms of the kind, and now I'm talking topics, the kinds of things that we might hear, they would have to be things that percolated up from the federal trial courts. Uh, the, the one thing about our nation is we have a separate system that flows through the state system and then we have a federal system and, and, and designed to address in some ways different interests. And, uh, and so, yes, that is a very important point to make. Uh, you get cases, do you, not not only from the federal district courts, but perhaps from, from state agencies like maybe the Federal Trade Commission or someplace like that. Do, do those uh, appeals from those agencies' uh, decisions wind their way to your court? Yes. Um, as a matter of statute, uh, there are a number of federal agencies that uh, there are appeals from their federal agency determinations, final agency determinations. Uh, and uh, for example, you, we get a number of immigration cases that yeah. flow through the immigration system. And after the adjudication by or the decision by the agency, the, the next stop would be in a federal, federal appellate court. Uh, so that's exactly right. There, uh, of course, uh, uh, there is what they call the DC Circuit, which is one of our peer circuits, and they often handle a lot of agency matters as well, because of course they're right there in the middle of it uh, in Washington, DC. But we do have, yes, uh, our, as a matter of law, there are a number of agency matters that can come to us. Remind our viewers about the state, federal, this sounds a little funny, but the states that all have federal court systems in them, that the that appeals go to your court. What states are under your jurisdiction? Sure, um, in in the Tenth Circuit, we yes. have uh, we have six states. Uh, we have Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, Wyoming, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. I think I counted six. Yeah, and uh, and so yes, and and those I, I sort of view that as roughly uh, the Rocky Mountain states. And what you find uh, generally is uh, that the the federal appellate courts are cut up with perhaps the exception of the Ninth Circuit, which includes Colorado. The federal appellate courts are sort of cut up around sort of rough ge geographic regions that sort of, I think, roughly reflect the same outlook and views on, on things and, and deal with some of the same sorts of issues. Uh, what, what about environmental issues? I would think there's so many environmental issues with water and with air quality. Absolutely. That, that say. Give us some examples of, of cases that have come through that we, you've had to deal with. Absolutely. There are, um, as, as you, a number of uh, your viewers probably know, uh, uh, there has been a good bit of litigation involving uh, Oklahoma and the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has a number of rules that they promulgate or put out an issue that sometimes affects states and, and as a consequence, not only affecting states, but affecting uh, utilities. And, and that generates um, a good bit of litigation. Uh, and you will have, uh, outside of the Oklahoma context, as I alluded to uh, before, you will have um, a number of instances in which because the federal government will be the custodian for land, that triggers uh, often issues related to uh, the Endangered Species Act. I mean, we get cases involving 
uh, people who are suing to protect certain endangered species. Uh, I had a big case involving a little minnow, you know, where they were doing, they were doing water, I mean, but it was a big deal, I mean, to the people involved. I mean, they were doing uh, sort of water uh, work in New Mexico, and water's a huge issue in New Mexico, and, and, and there were concerns by the environmentalists that it was going to impact on the lifespan of these minnows. And so, um, so yes, I, one of the things about the Tenth Circuit is um, that you do encounter a number of environmental issues, um, and there are some very active uh, participants in that sort of arena, uh, both the environmental groups and also, you know, the stakes are very high for uh, companies like OG&E and other utilities that uh, are have, who are affected by these regulations. Uh, in, in particular, the one that comes to mind is the uh, the EPA. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, how one becomes a judge on the Tenth Circuit. Uh, there are no fundamental requirements, I guess. I mean, you don't have to have been a judge at the district court level in order to be named to the circuit court level, which is the next higher rung. Uh, what are the basic requirements to be a Tenth Circuit judge, or a judge in the circuit court system? It is indeed a mystery, Kent, <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 uh, that remains to be determined. Um, I, I think well, that, I was hoping to find uh, out. I, I, well, um, I, regrettably, <laughs> I'm going to disappoint you, but I would, I would say this, that um, Judges come uh, to the court, to our court and to other circuit courts, with different backgrounds. I mean, they are they are people in most instances. I, I would think of considerable accomplishment as lawyers, and uh, and but but in terms of the array, the array of legal experiences that they bring or their portfolio of legal experiences, they're different. Um, I, I think that there 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 is some. Um, Particularly over time, you, uh, there have been more. There's been a trend towards appointing people to the circuit court who have been trial judges. But certainly, to, as you alluded to, uh, that is not um, uh, that is not a requirement. Certainly, it was not in my case. I, I came uh, to the court right after <coughs> being at uh, your old law firm. Although I had been initially nominated for a trial judge position and then was renominated. So the short answer is that, uh, I mean, there are, of course, lawyers and, 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 and lawyers that are generally uh, held in uh, high esteem both by their, uh, the community and by the legal profession. And, but they are ultimately, um, they are political appointments. And so you, that brings into play people who may not necessarily be lawyers. I mean, the people who are making the ultimate decision may not be lawyers themselves. And so it's, and, and, and at least one could argue that's a good thing, that you have, you know, citizens who, who look and evaluate the character and evaluate other things beyond the fact that whether you're a good lawyer and can dot the I, I mean, is this the kind of person we want making uh, important decisions uh, that will control our lives for the rest of their life, theoretically? Uh, and so, yeah, it's uh, it, it is a mystery, uh, but uh, but there I think there are some basic uh, variables to it. Jerome Holmes is a federal judge on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. We'll be back more with Justice Holmes right after this. The land to us is how we make our living. It's not an easy life. This land that OERB restored for me had pump jack stands. It had old building foundations with pipes sticking out of them. I could never have been able to afford to do these improvements like OERB did. They didn't just come out and put a Band-Aid on it. It's back to the prairie. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. 
Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. Welcome back to The Verdict. Jerome Holmes sits on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. You've been on the court now for nine years. I have. How, how have things changed in, in those nine years? I'm old, <laughs> but, 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 but beyond that, uh, I, I would say that um, as with uh, businesses and, uh, and certainly government agencies, we've all embraced technology in order to become more efficient. Yeah. And I think one of the significant changes I've seen on the court in those nine years is uh, our ability to avail ourselves of, uh, of technology to reach out and electronically get access to things that we uh, earlier would have to rely upon hard paper to do that. And I mean, and, and, the, and the most concrete example I can give you is that one of the things that uh, judges do on the court, on our, the Tenth Circuit anyway, is they often will look at um, cases before uh, they're put on a particular docket and they'll, they'll make determinations, just general ter determinations as to whether those cases will go to oral argument or whether those cases will go somewhere else. I used to periodically get boxes of, of briefs and cases you know, when I first got on the court and my only job at that time was to look at it and say okay this goes to oral argument this goes someplace else and then we'd pack them up and ship them back I mean the only people who were making a lot of money out of that were overnight carriers now all, <laughs> all of that stuff is done electronically I mean I get I get PDFs and I just you know hit a little button and it's done uh -huh. and so I, I think that uh, that whole process of, of uh, that is really an ongoing endeavor of of, auto, of uh, making taking advantage of electronic means to both push information to re receive information and then to use it in our work. I, I think has increased the efficiency of the court and has allowed for, frankly, more time to focus on 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 the substance of what we're doing, which is the important stuff anyway. Um, you and Judge Bacharach from Oklahoma both serve on the Tenth Circuit Court Correct. of Appeals. I guess there are other states who have two judges. We seem yes. well represented. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, the the really the norm on the Tenth Circuit uh, is that uh, every state has two active judges, as they call it, uh, but Colorado and Wyoming. Colorado has three judges and, and uh, active judges, and Wyoming has one. And so, so every other state, all the, uh, the other four states have two active judges. Uh, and there are also what, what we call senior judges, which uh, I, I think a lot of the American public doesn't know, that this classification, which really is uh, judges who, in effect, could be retired. I mean, once you take senior status, you don't have to work at all. You can just collect your check, and that would be it. But, but uh, you've got a lot of very, you know, workaholics who become federal judges, and most of those people, a good number of them, don't stop working. They, they cut back sometimes, and, and there are varying degrees to which they work, but, but they work. They continue to work, and as long as they keep a certain case low, they have staff. And we have seven of those uh, in the Tenth Circuit, and it's, it's critical to managing the caseload to have people who are willing to continue to sort of take an oar and row. Um, and so, yes, uh, back to your question, uh, yes, every uh, state but those two, Colorado mm -hmm. and Wyoming, has two uh, judges, and we're fortunate to have Judge Bacharach on, and uh, he also was in uh, Kent Myers' old law firm, and so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've stocked the court. Yeah, it sounds like it. Well, let me ask you uh, a little different question that's uh, always been a mystery to me. Uh, typically, when a case is uh, lodged in the Tenth Circuit properly, uh, and decided uh, it will be decided by a panel of three judges. I'm never been, I've never known how particular cases get assigned to a particular panel of, of three judges. Can you I, enlighten me on I that? I certainly, bit? I can speak to that. And, and really, I think it's very important for the public to understand this, um, that uh, with very, very few exceptions, uh, and there's always a good reason why, um, these cases are randomly assigned. 
and 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 I think it's important for people to understand that because you can you can, I've been on uh, either a blessing or a curse some high profile cases in the last couple of years, and and the question always arises: Well, how do certain people get on those cases? And and the uh, the answer almost every time is just the spin. There's a, I, I use sort of the uh, reference metaphorically the spin of the wheel, but the reality is there's a computer program that just sort of sorts it out, and and you just uh, through that computer program you just get your name gets popped out uh, and you sit on these uh, these panels of cases and so uh, that that means that there is no bias uh, uh, going in that you know we're trying to pick Jerome Holmes because he has certain views or anything of that sort it just mm -hmm. or we believe he has those views and uh, and, and I think that that adds to the legitimacy of the system. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, once the name pops out, if you have some conflict or there's some reason why you can't participate, then you can withdraw. But at least the initial uh, determination or assignment is uh, almost entirely random. How do you split your time personally <laughs> between here and, and uh, Denver? Most of the time is here. Um, so you have an office here? Oh yes, uh, yeah. uh, yes. My main office is here. My staff is here. Um, I have a sort of scaled down, stripped down office in Denver, which I don't need more than that. It's uh, it's that's where our main courthouse is. Uh, we periodically go there to hear what they call oral argument, where the the lawyers come and they appear and they represent their clients. Uh, and making arguments to the court, but and that court is in Denver, and my, I have you know I have a small office there, and I go there and I hear the cases, and I come back. I mean, on an appellate court, uh, essentially the guts of the job is is as I tell people, it's reading and writing, and I think I can do that. You know, I, I that's uh, the and but at at a sense that one is. Um, taking in the material and, and evaluating it and producing opinions uh, based upon mostly the paper that is presented, but in those few instances uh, on the arguments that are made. But most of the time is here. Uh, we have a set schedule of between September and May in which every other month between September and May I will go up and hear arguments and then come back. Uh, a feature that's always been interesting to me, I haven't seen it recently, but I'm sure it's still there. One of my first oral arguments before the Tenth Circuit, one of my three uh, judges sitting was a justice of the United States Supreme Court. Justice Tom Clark was on the first case I argued with two other judges from the Tenth Circuit. And another time I was there with two judges from the Tenth Circuit and a, a lower court district judge was sitting by designation on that panel. Has that happened? Does that still happen? Yes, uh, and, and the phrase you used, uh, by designation, is exactly the right one. Uh, there are, um, we have, uh, periodically, we have district court trial judges who will uh, sit on, on the circuit court, uh, particularly when they first uh, come into the system as, as district court judges. I, uh, it's, it's often viewed as an opportunity for them, number one, to meet us and to put names to faces and also to have a sort of sense of what, 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 is, what goes on behind the screen, you know. <laughs> when, when these people are evaluating our cases, uh, the, the trial judges, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. And so, and so that, that goes on. And also there are judges from other courts. Uh, we get sometimes periodically we'll get judges from other circuit courts who will sit with us. And uh, you alluded to Supreme Court justices that often, uh, not often, but uh, you, it is not uncommon that you will have a situation where uh, judge, justices will step down, as in Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, mm -hmm. from her regular duties, but she keeps her commission. So if she wants to serve as a judge somewhere, she still can do that. And you're very involved uh, in the community, uh, so give us a rundown on, on your community involvement here in Oklahoma City. Well, Mayor, as you know, Oklahoma City is great, uh, and uh, I, I, Oklahoma uh, is my adopted home, and, and I have embraced Oklahoma with the zealousness of a convert. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I love this place, and I love Oklahoma City, and as a consequence, uh, something I take gratitude, I, uh, I'm gratified by is the opportunity to be involved in civic activities. I, and I do that mostly through uh, nonprofit board service. I'm uh, currently the chair of the Oklahoma City Museum of Art Board of Trustees. I just got off a tenure as president of the uh, Downtown Rotary Club. And 
Uh, I'm uh, a member of the board of uh, the Oklahoma uh, Medical Research Foundation. And lest the taxpayer be concerned, I work very, very hard <laughs> at my day job. And so, and so they're getting their money's worth, they can be assured. Uh, Judge Holmes, thanks for being on The Verdict. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it's it. It's good to see you. Kent and I will be right back. There are now 11 million of us who live here and work here. I was 15 when I came here six years ago. I raised my family here. I drive my truck to my job every day. The only difference between now and six years ago, I do it legally. I wanted to because this is my home. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality assistance and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. We have uh, uh, children come from a different lifestyle different mindset. You have to open your arms and really do what you have to do to have that child become a part of your family. And if it's more patience, that's what you do. Kids got to know they can trust you. And that's what we've tried to do with these kids. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. Nick Cornett and Kent Myers back on The Verdict. We are wrapping up a show with Jerome Holmes. Yes, it's really glad to have, we were glad to have Judge Holmes back with us at another time. He's just a terrific uh, participant from Oklahoma mm -hmm. on the Court of uh, Appeals. We're proud of it. He represents us well. You can get more information about his duties at uh, a website, CA10, that's Circuit of Court 10, um, dot uscourts.gov, ca10.uscourts.gov. We'll see you next week.
actually, I'm going to drink this water. I'll get you some water. 